part is why do we need light trapping and uh, this is speci this will become especially more important when we talk about thin film solar cells and the, the reason we need light trapping in solar cells is because silicon is a shabby absorber of light it is an indirect band gap material it needs uh, not just a photon but a phonon in combination uh, to absorb light and it actually is very selective to what it wants to absorb. It absorbs the blue light with a very high absorption coefficient. So, if you shine uh, ultraviolet or blue light, it is absorbed in like the very first uh, few nanometers of your silicon. But it is very bad at absorbing this red light. So, this light of higher wavelengths and for these red lights, you need to have a vapor which is more than a centimeter thick and nobody wants, you know to spend that much silicon. So, this limits, this necessitates the need for having light trapping schemes uh, in your uh, solar cell. So, the very first and the simplest light trapping scheme is having a anti reflection uh, co coating. So, uh, the way anti reflection uh, coating works is that it breaks this symmetry uh, in your crystal. So, you apply this anti reflection coating on uh, only one side, and what it does is that for light coming on this side, it will bend it more, and over here you will have a you know a normal shiny reflecting surface. So, you essentially increase the angle of your total internal reflection. It is like you know if you are having a water, the same ph phenomena we use in immersion lithography that if you coat your material or if you coat your substrate with a material of higher refractive index, uh, it would uh, essentially increase or bend your light and you only apply it on one side of the solar cell and that is typically the side facing the incoming radiation. And for this optimum uh, refractive index of your anti reflective coefficient coating, it has to be uh, the geometric mean of the refractive index of your silicon and air. So, air has a refractive index of 1 silicon has a refractive index of you know 3.4. So, the ideal number is you know the square root of 3.5 and that is close to what is the refractive index of silicon nitride. So, silicon nitride by default uh, is the material which is used for making these uh, anti reflective uh, co coatings. And uh, you know this is something that is very easily derived from Snell's law. I am assuming that <coughs> you guys know this. So, the other light trapping scheme which is which is again very routinely used in uh, all solar cells is texturing of your uh, surface and that again what it does is that uh, for an incoming light if you uh, have uh, incoming light if you have a normal surface it will just go like this and you know bounce back. What it does is that it bounces this light off at these you know at these larger angles and then when it comes back it is uh, it meets the requirement for total internal reflection and does not go out. And uh, the ideal surface that people say to have you know to maximize your light trapping is actually having a random textured surface or what which it is more the more technical term for that is having a lumbarsian surface. And there are people who have derived theoretical limits for that because it depends upon the refractive index of your uh, silicon, and that's called there's a limit called uh, Yaboyevich limit, which gives this formula. There's a professor now at uh, Berkeley who derived this limit. And uh, <coughs> so the question is why why do why do people say random texturing is better? You know, I I know so much, so many things of making regular patterns like I can make you know I can do a self assembly and make very at a very low cost make a very regular uh, array of dots. Why not do that as compared to making this uh, making this uh, random pattern and the reason for that is selectivity for your incoming light it works both ways. So, if you make it very regular if you have light coming at at one angle it would be fine, but what if you know your light is coming at another angle or if your solar cell is not placed on a tracker. So, selectivity comes at a price you know if you want to make it uh, more regular you can do that, but uh, then you again need very uh, very good tracking. So, usually the random uh, random roughness of 
your top surface, that is the best light trapping scheme and it is also called as Lamartian uh, surface uh, and that is I will talk about how it is actually uh, generated uh, during uh, manufacturing. And <coughs> what these light trapping schemes do is that over here I am plotting the percentage of light absorbed as a function of thickness of my cell. So, as you can see if it is uh, 100 micron thick cells, it absorbs all these wavelengths very nicely. If it is a 10 micron cell, you know it does a decent job. If it is a 2 micron cell, it absorbs all the blue wavelengths because those wavelengths silicon is very good at absorbing, but all these red wavelengths it misses out because you know it, it just cannot absorb it when it the life bounces comes in and bounces back that total length is not enough for your silicon to absorb this light. What these light trapping schemes do is that they increase the number of times your line lines will bounce because it just it changes the angle. So, it in each bounce it uh, uh, it travels more distance and you will have more number of bounces as well. So, what it does now for this 2 micron uh, thick cell instead of being a very poor trapper of light at red wavelengths, it becomes a decent trapper of light at these red wavelengths. And now you can see it is absorbing uh, uh, this light, uh, uh, these lights, red lights more nicely. And uh, the same thing happens, uh, you can translate into efficiency. So, uh, again this is my Shockley Quasier limit given by Mr. Shockley himself. And this is as a function of thickness. So, as I have a thick cell, uh, I get uh, efficiency like this, but as the thickness is decreased, this efficiency uh, falls off because uh, I am not able to absorb my red lights. But when I put this light trapping scheme or I roughen my surface, now I can increase this efficiency of these uh, thin cells. So, that is why you know light trapping schemes are routinely uh, employed. And there, there is always this efficiency of how much, how thick a cell you need. The more thick a cell you put, you will be able to absorb a large percentage of your light. So, this red curve is the percentage of light absorbed. So, as I am decreasing, increasing my thickness, I am absorbing a lot of my light. But at the same time, since that absorbed or that generated electrons and holes have to travel a large distance a lot of them will get trapped and they, we won't be able to extract them out. So, the percentage of carriers that I can collect that falls if I make a thicker and thicker cell. So, there is an optimum for essentially uh, uh, generating this uh, optimum thickness and uh, those are given over here. What these light trapping schemes do is they essentially push that whole curve up because you now can do much more with a smaller or a thinner cell. Right, so I want to move to uh, change gears and give a more uh, talk about the key developments that happened have happened specifically in crystalline solar uh, silicon cells. So crystalline solar silicon cells, you know, the this is the efficiencies as a progression uh, of uh, time, and you know. Uh, this kind of this was the time where we understood about silicon processing. So, it peaked from 1 to 10 percent over there, but it stayed pretty much constant and this is where most of the industry and cells especially all the cells you can buy uh, shipping from uh, China that is from Suntec, Yingli or Trina which is you know the three main biggest suppliers of solar cells, uh, crystalline solar cells in the world, their efficiencies would be somewhere over here. And then you have these other high efficiency cells which are more expensive and a lot of them are made in research labs. They are not actually uh, competitive enough in cost to be produced. And then you have in between the cell by sun power which has an efficiency of around 24 percent. And that is actually commercially sold but not in very high quantity because it is again very expensive uh, to produce. So, what happened from hair to hair, what were some of the key developments which you know pushed up the efficiency. <coughs> so, very quick uh, run through. So, you know a development which happened in uh, 1970s was this thing called back surface uh, field. So, 
this is how most of your crested and solar uh, silicon cells look. They have these fingers on the top, which are you know uh, uh, your emitter, and then you have this thing at the back. Which is called as collector. It's essentially, you know, these two contacts. You just name it uh, that way. And what happened was this back surface uh, passivation. So people used to use uh, aluminum for that. And what they figured out that if you uh, heat up or fire that aluminum, it actually forms a, a, a P plus uh, dopant uh, in your uh, solar cell. And what it does is that it's that P plus doping over here. It used to repel electrons from coming over here. So it used to you know repel one kind of carriers from recombining so it became a more selective contact that is what happened in uh, 1970 and this was you know first developed in 1974 and uh, what you did was essentially instead of having just pn you made this layer p plus so you made this contact uh, more selective just to hold and that kicked up your efficiencies in this uh, 16 to 17 uh, percent uh, range. Remember, the theoretical limit for silicon is, is 32 percent, as we just uh, discussed. And it's called the back surface field because this was on the back of the surface done by firing of this uh, aluminum into your silicon. And uh, then the next development, which was happened, was people actually passivated the top surface. So somebody figured out, you know, that surface recombination was a big thing and a lot of these generated uh, carriers were just combining on the surface. Uh, important thing to note is that, you know, your, as we discussed, our blue light likes to get, absor get absorbed at the very top of the silicon uh, surface. So a lot of our blue lights are just absorbed at the very top and if that surface is not uh, well passivated, all of those carriers will just recombine at the surface. So uh, people figured out, you know, it would be a it would be a decent idea to put some silicon oxide over there. Uh, and this was done again uh, in uh, uh, 1980s, and this is called the passive emitter. So first we uh, passivated the collector. The next thing they figured out was to passivate the emitter surface. And uh, this again, you know, uh, happened in the, in the mid uh, 80s. And uh, this is called the passivated uh, both emitter and collector are now uh, passivated. And uh, um, also you can see people are now starting to use this texturing. That is, they are trying to texture the cell. So earlier people were doing this uh, using lithography. I'll show a very cool technique where you just dip it in uh, KOH solution or you dip it in KOH. And by default, you get these uh, textures uh, on, uh, on your solar cell. Then somebody figured out, you know, that these a lot of that red light is being generated here, and if it's generated actually inside my n plus region and not in my depletion region, I'm actually losing all those carriers, right? So, what somebody figured out next was, you know, it would be a nice, it would be a fine thing to just dope it where I need my contact and keep my doping low in rest of my emitter, and. Uh, so what people figured out next was these diffuse junctions and to form this N plus pocket only where you're putting your uh, fingers and this was called, you know, uh, passivation and then also uh, putting your contacts just where you need them. And so this happened next, it's called the passivated emitter rear locally diffuse, that's, you know, quite a mouthful. So most common term is pearl cell that you know you have your local contacts just where you need them and the rest of the whole silicon is uh, undoped and this pushed up your efficiencies you know to uh, you know very close to 20 percent the and people figured out how to dope these cells so the most common scheme you'll use is nobody uses ion implant lithography those things that we learn about process technology are just too cost expensive to use here. So the way you dope this is you apply a layer of uh, you know, glass or most commonly called uh, uh, PSG or phosphosilicate glass or it's called a pockel implant and then you diffuse, you fire and diffuse these dopants from that glass into your silicon and then you just strip it off. So that's the way these uh, cells uh, are uh, doped. And uh, <coughs> 
people figured it out and you know the efficiencies of up to 25 percent were achieved uh, using uh, these kind of schemes where you would have only doped pockets where you are forming your contact and the rest of the cell would be relatively undoped or doped uh, very less and you will have these optimum texture on the top uh, either these pyramids standing up or these pyramids uh, etched into your silicon which would be used to uh, enhance your uh, light trapping. <coughs> so these cells also you know they figured out what was you know till it's not 32 you know Shockley said it's 32 why am I getting only 25. So they figured out that a lot of this light was still being lost at the front surface because you know this this front surface will still absorb a lot of blue light and it will get since you have this selector over here it will still get absorbed at the top. So what was limiting this efficiency of this cell was again what they figured out what was mostly efficient limiting this efficiency efficiency to 25 percent was this front surface. And the people who figured it out was uh, uh, here at Stanford and uh, the next big breakthrough which came here uh, by uh, from the team at Stanford was that uh, so this was a completely new uh, not a com I mean this was a you know a radical redesign of the cell. So what they did was they uh, they figured out that it would be best it would be a fine idea to put both your P and N contact at the back of the cell. So again this is going way against my conventional understanding. I understand my PN junction as something where P would be at the top and N would be at the bottom but this is a redesign of the cell which says uh, you know this is the side facing my sunlight and let that surface be you know just be as pristine as possible and I will just put both my N and P contacts at the back and this is a uh, both are new radical redesign. It's also very costly redesign because now I have to print this interdigitated fingers on the back. So I have to use some kind of lithography, and lithography is not a term usually liked by solar manufacturers to print these interdigitated uh, fingers. So this is uh, this is what you know is, is is they still hold the world record for highest uh, efficiencies, and uh, what you need to make this is make these. Uh, PNN uh, interdigitated fingers uh, at the back. <coughs> Another design which, which I just want to mention because we talked about that you don't necessarily need uh, PN junctions to make your solar cell. So this is a cell sold by Spanio. It's called their hit cell. It's it's probably not that big a hit, but the way it works is that you have this crystalline material and you deposit this amorphous silicon at the top and the bottom and this is has higher band gap than your uh, crystalline silicon. So it forms these selective contacts with respect to your crystalline silicon. But it's, it's based on that idea of that, that PN junction is not the only way to make a selective contact. <coughs> so a final thing in the last five minutes that I want to uh, cover is you know how do I get from there to um, here. And I want to do it in as less process steps as possible, as cheap process steps as possible. Use no lithography, uh, ion implantations, things like that are you know completely tabooed because they just add so much cost. So how do I get from there to here? And the first thing uh, that uh, you'll see is that the first thing that you'll see is that you know if you go around the Bay Area and look at the different panels, you'll see two of these different kinds. One looks something like this, and one looks something like this. And uh, just by looking at it, you can tell that this is crystalline because it was probably made out of a ignit and it was cut into this uh, square or this uh, octahedron shape. And the way, it, the reason it's done in this shape is because that's the shape which gives you the maximum square area for a given uh, for a given um, uh, circle and you know we there's a problem on that in problem set 3 and the other way you can get it is you know the thing called multi crystalline cell so these are actually casted into these squares instead of uh, drawing from uh, Tchaikovsky uh, crystalline kind of uh, growth 
and they look like this. So just by looking at it, if it looks like that, it's a single crystalline shell. If it looks like this, uh, it's uh, so most of the Stanford EE classes, which are you know solar lab cells, or if you take any lab lab class in Stanford, they use cells like this. The way the multicrystalline cells are done is that you start with really that box of sand and you uh, let it melt and cool slowly so it forms because there is no initial crystal to initiate the growth it forms multiple of these crystals then you scar them into blocks and then grind them but this is much cheaper than growing it from a ignit. Uh, the drawback is that it has it is not a single crystalline thing so it has uh, multiple of these crystals and you get like few percentage points less of efficiency when you make it out of multicrystalline versus if you make out of uh, single crystalline because you have recombination at all these uh, grains. How do they make it? So the very first step you do is you take this wafer. It could either be coming from a, a silicon uh, which was grown single crystalline or a multicrystalline thing and you dope and you dip it in a KOH solution or you dip it in a KOH bath for uh, uh, two minutes and KOH has this unique property that it selectively etches along uh, your uh, uh, 110 uh, crystalline direction and it by default forms these param pyramids which are random in texture and they have uh, this uh, distance of you know average distance of 10 micron and uh, and that depends upon how di how long you etch it for if you if you dip it for two minutes you get this distance if you dip it for a larger time you'll get larger pyramids but you will get these random pyramids uh, for you know for free and uh, this is what you need for uh, light trapping. And then the next thing they do is uh, they form that uh, uh, that uh, P plus uh, layer uh, on the top. So the way this is done is again implantation is taboo. So the way you do it is you uh, deposit uh, this uh, uh, phosphosilicate glass and you fire it so that diffuses uh, from your phosphosilicate glass the dopants diffuse into your silicon and uh, then you etch off that PSG layer with HF and shown here is you know uh, a furnace which is uh, used for uh, doing this. <coughs> and then the next thing you need to do is because since this was done everywhere this thing will form on the edge as well. So you do an edge bead removal. So you remove that dope layer from the edge and then you coat it uh, with the anti-reflection coating. So this is done uh, This is done typically by a CVD process. So there will be a CVD chamber and these people want these chambers to be very fast, very through, very high throughput. So you deposit uh, a very thin silicon oxide first because that gives you good passivation and then you deposit your silicon nitride which forms your anti-reflection uh, coating layer. And then the next thing you do is you form these uh, lines uh, on the top. So you form these uh, lines on the top. So you do metallization both at the back to form your collector and the top to form your emitter. And again lithography is a complete taboo. We just do not want to, they do not want to hear the L word. So the way you do it is you do screen printing. You uh, have this plates and you uh, essentially to, again they want to minimize the material as well. So they will not do something like evaporation because that will lose a lot of material. So you take a small amount of material and sweep it through the screen and wherever there are holes in the screen it will just deposit. Uh, on uh, those places on top of uh, your silicon and you will be left with having those uh, uh, those lines and you will essentially have these lines like this and uh, then you form deposit another set of lines for uh, soldering and then you, you when you form these lines you deposit these silver lines which are essentially used to connect these different fingers. So there are a few of these uh, line screen printing steps and you do one firing step where essentially you the way you uh, this thing diffuses through your anti-reflection coefficient or whatever passivation you used over here is that again you can't do lithography. So you deposit the material you want and then you just fire it in. So you just 
do a thermal process at the fuel. It's not a very neat process, but it's a very cheap process. So you just fire it in, and it forms those contacts there locally. And uh, that's essentially it. So you are done with your solar cell. We want to keep our number of steps a uh, minimum. And the next thing they do is you have these cameras which come in, shine light. They immediately measure uh, the EQA of your cells. So they bin these cells. The good ones go to you know. Uh, to your roof, the bad ones or you know the medium ones go on top of Walmart, and uh, these are these robots which essentially these are these camera, these are you know the biggest cameras over there, and they shine light on your solar cell and you know immediately bend them very quickly, and uh, that's it. The the cell is done. The next thing you do is the module, and you have these uh, again. Some people do it manually, so. You solder these cells either in series or parallel. So you can solder them together in, uh, you know, this is showing them in series. So <coughs> this is showing three cells uh, in series. The current remains the same. The voltage add up if you do it uh, in series. And they are always lined up like this. So you'll have emitter of one connecting to the collector of the other one, the emitter of this one connecting to the collector of this other one. If you add them up in parallel, yeah, your voltage will remain the same, your current will uh, multiply. Or you can connect them in series where your voltage will increase but your current will remain the same. And this is showing a panel with uh, 72 cells connected uh, in series. So the voltage is still 0.5 volt and sorry, so the voltage is 0.5 into 72, that's uh, 36 and then your current remains the same. So wh what's the problem with connecting it this way? What do you think is the problem? Yeah, so suppose if, 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 if this, this is placed on top of your roof and this happens, right? There's a leaf which comes and blocks one of them. What, what will happen to the whole panel? But since ones can't function and they're all in series, it will be your whole panel. Or even if there's some shadowing or if there's a particle of dust, there's some, you know, sandstorm, and it blocks one of these cells. All of these cells will go back. So they are connected using a combination of series and parallel. So there are a few of them connected, not few, like I think a lot of them connected in series, and then these blocks are connected in parallel. That's it. I want to introduce this one more slide. So these, even within that uh, one dollar per watt that I talked about. Uh, so this is how that cost is distributed across the different processes. And uh, um, just to start with, if I start with polysilicon, make these ignits and dice them, that adds like 15 cents plus 6 cents uh, plus uh, 9. So that's uh, 21, 30 cents per watt is just coming from making this from my starting substrate, even before I start making the cell. So there's a lot of emphasis on uh, reducing this amount of silicon or um, decreasing that amount of silicon, and that is something that our speaker on uh, Wednesday will uh, talk about. So his company is, is trying to keep this rest of the thing like a solar uh, single crystalline cell, but trying to reduce this uh, silicon. And there are a bunch of startups uh, in the valley which are trying to do that. 